Uh, good morning, everyone. If you'd like to come in and take a seat, we'll get started right away. Welcome to the uh, third in our morning sessions of the uh, 37th annual Moore College Lectures, uh, delivered by Professor Michael Horton, entitled The Lord and Life Giver, The Holy Spirit Changes Everything. If you're a visitor to the college today, we'd especially like to welcome you uh, and uh, hope that uh, you enjoy uh, your time with us as we continue to hear about this really important topic uh, from our, uh, our visitor. This is the third in the series uh, this week. There was an overview last week where uh, Michael took us across the whole range of scriptural teaching and uh, each day this week we've been sinking different shafts. We've looked at the spirit in the context of the Trinity, the spirit in the context of uh, the relationship with Christ and today uh, we move to uh, Pentecost and uh, thinking about uh, the implications of the work of the spirit in that context and I'm certainly looking forward to that as I'm sure you all are. Could I ask you if you have a mobile phone to uh, turn it to silent airport mode or throw it out the door, whatever, <laughs> just as long as it doesn't go off in the next uh, hour, uh, that would be terrific. And uh, a reminder also that there'll be a time for questions at the end of the lecture, as always, uh, from the floor. Uh, but also uh, you might be the person that uh, thinks better on paper and if you'd like to write a question there's a box immediately outside that door and I'm hoping that door where you can put those questions and uh, Michael will uh, pick those up and address them in the context of, uh, of tomorrow or Friday's lecture depending on when it's appropriate that's there. Um, we're also uh, going to uh, have a, a scripture reading in just a moment um, and uh, that will uh, set the context uh, for what we're doing and I'll uh, invite Jane to uh, come and uh, read uh, Acts 2 for us now. Um, good morning. So Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, as a fire, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Amalites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Figuria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on this throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and of that, we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for every good gift to us that comes from your hand. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your servant, Michael, and his service of us this week in taking us deeper into the teaching of your word. We pray now that you will help us to continue to grasp the truths that are set out before us, that you will help us to be transformed by these truths, that we might live faithfully before you. And this we ask in Jesus' name and in the power of your spirit. Amen. I invite you now to join me in welcoming Professor Michael Horton to deliver the third of his lecture series. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Jane, for reading our text this morning. Stirring passage, isn't it? It's always uh, almost a fresh reading every time you hear it. Thank you for coming out, taking the time uh, to listen to these lectures and uh, interact and engage with me on these. I have a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, uh, where does Jesus' miraculous power uh, come from? What do you think is happening in Mark 5.30. Here, well, it's, here's what's happening in Mark uh, 5.30. Uh, uh, the woman who uh, had the issue of blood, um, and if I touch his garments, I will be made well. Immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garment? So what's happening here is uh, that uh, Jesus is uh, apparently unaware of who touched him. Uh, 
but just that a power has gone out of him. What, what is that power? Uh, I don't believe it's his, his divinity. Um, uh, I, it, it's hard to say. Uh, I don't know what it is that went out of him except to feel that uh, the, the, you know, it, it sounds like he, it, there, there, there was a charge and he, was, he, he lost that charge momentarily as the power went out. I, I have nothing uh, to, to say beyond that. I'm sure uh, others here, here could. But what it does point up um, is a point that I didn't, wasn't able to develop fully yesterday, um, and that is the interchangeability of the Spirit and Jesus. On one hand, we, I think we have to be very careful about uh, replacing a Logos Christology with a Spirit Christology, so that uh, the, the, the Spirit replaces the deity of Christ. If, if the opposite danger is uh, replacing the uh, Spirit with the deity of Christ, we shouldn't make the opposite mistake. Uh, and so we, we have to affirm both that the Logos became flesh, and in every one of these actions, it is the Logos performing these miracles, the enfleshed Son of God. And yet at the same time, he performs these miracles as a prophet, uh, as, as the consummate prophet, uh, and does so in the power of the Spirit, as the Old Testament prophets did. And in that sense, he fulfills the office of prophet uh, as our faithful representative. Um, the, the tendency to conflate Jesus with the Spirit is very great, uh, especially looking at the farewell discourse where there's so much of an intimacy between Jesus' mission and the Spirit's mission. Um, Paul can speak interchangeably of the Spirit and Christ. So if you have the Spirit of Christ, uh, uh, if, you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have Christ. If you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The interchangeability, however, shouldn't, uh, cause us to forget the difference between Jesus and the Spirit. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is another paraclete. He's another advocate. Uh, he, isn't ex he isn't the same person as Jesus. Uh, when Raymond Brown, for example, says, the paraclete is the presence of Jesus when Jesus is absent. Indeed, another Jesus, end quote. Uh, I, th I think that that reflects an over-realized eschatology for one and uh, a tendency to collapse Jesus and the Spirit and then into the Spirit and then both into the church um, as Christ's uh, continuing incarnation. Now, Jesus promised another paraclete. See, the point is, and then I'll move on to today's talk, the Holy Spirit doesn't replace Jesus. That's the key. The Holy Spirit does what Jesus cannot do because Jesus isn't the third person of the Holy Trinity. Each person has incommunicable properties that belong distinctively to that person, that make that person of the Trinity that person of the Trinity. And Jesus is the advocate who defends us at the cross all the way to the point of shedding his blood for us and being raised on the third day. And the Holy Spirit is the, the paraclete who witnesses publicly and within our hearts that all this, is, uh, all this is true. And that's why it's good that Jesus goes to the Father, not because the Holy Spirit will replace him, but because now, for the first time, the Holy Spirit will mediate his presence in a way the disciples never knew. They will know him not as the historical Jesus merely, but as the Christ of faith. They will not only know him as a friend, they've gotten to know over the last three years, they will know him as their elder brother and eschatological head of the new race of which they are a part. Now they're co-heirs with him of the Father's estate. All of that is because the Holy Spirit has come. Which leads us now to the age of the Spirit. Um, and uh, some of you, I understand, have noted my fondness uh, for the word covenant. Um, I want it to be recorded, though, that I haven't used that term until now. Uh, now I'm going to use the term covenant because we're, when we talk about the way the Holy Spirit relates to his people, 
we have to re- remember uh, that there are different covenants that uh, prescribe the way God relates to his people in any given age. And sometimes, in the same age, different covenants are in operation. So of first importance in understanding the Spirit's role prior to Christ's advent is to identify the covenantal context in which he's operative. There are actually two that dominate the Old Testament horizon, as you know, the Abrahamic and the Sinaitic. Uh, Reformed federal theology distinguishes between a covenant of works made with humanity in Adam and a covenant of grace with Christ as the mediator. But the question is to what extent the Sinai covenant displays the characteristics of a law covenant. In other words, to what extent is it similar, not identical, but similar in the, in the form and structure and terms of the treaty to the covenant that God made with Adam in paradise before the fall and the covenant that Israel swore at Mount Sinai. On this particular point, there's been considerable debate in the history of Reformed exegesis. Uh, I've waded into those controversies a bit myself, but here I'm only going to summarize a few conclusions that related precisely to this topic of the Spirit. The Sinai Covenant, I take it, is indeed a, an administration of the covenant of grace. That is, it's in service to the Abrahamic promise, but the Abrahamic promise actually consisted of two promises, didn't it? Uh, in Genesis uh, 17, uh, Genesis 15, God promises, well, 12, 15, 17, promises two things, an earthly inheritance, an earthly land, an earthly people, and a heavenly land, heavenly inheritance, a heavenly seat. And uh, I take it that the book of Joshua is uh, very literal when it says at the, at the end of reporting all of God's fulfillment of his promises, God is the one who is giving the land into the hand of Israel. It's underscored again and again that Israel is basically sleeping while God's accomplishing all of this. At the end, not one of God's promises that he made to Abraham failed to be fulfilled. And so with, with the cleansing of the land, with the distribution of the spoils of victory to the 12 tribes, God has completed his promise to Abraham concerning the land. They're in by grace, they stay in by works. They stay in by obedience as a nation. It's important not to confuse the earthly with the heavenly promises. Like Hamlet's play within a play, the ministry of Moses, identified in scripture simply by shorthand as the law, is a parenthesis within the larger unfolding Abrahamic promise. Its laws, purification rituals, priesthood, and sacrificial cult form one vast typological system that points forward to Christ. But there's nothing in the system itself that would bring forgiveness, regeneration, or the bestowal of the Spirit. No provision at all in the covenant itself if Israel en masse fails to keep this law. The Sinai covenant is strictly a temporary, typological, conditional, and geopolitical treaty between Yahweh and one nation, Israel. The Sinai treaty promised long life for the nation in the land of Canaan on the condition of obedience to the law through the mediation of Moses, not everlasting life in God's heavenly kingdom through faith in Christ. And so Old Testament saints obtained everlasting life on the basis of promise, the promise that God made to Abraham of a greater seed, a greater land, a greater inheritance, rather than the law and the earthly promise. Abraham set his sights on a heavenly land, on the heavenly promise beyond what would be the failure of the earthly seed to keep that covenant. As we've seen, the spirit is at the center of the judicial actions in both the covenant with Adam, Genesis 3.8, and the Sinai Covenant. And the glory cloud is essential to that judicial action. Wherever the cloud goes, the people know that they have God's 
blessing. Wherever the cloud goes, they have God's provision and protection and God's presence. Without the presence, Israel is lo ami, not my people. As Moses recognizes in his plea for the Lord not to withdraw his presence in Exodus 33:15. And, and then, then he takes up residence in the temple. Uh, the, the spirit hides himself behind a curtain, behind a veil, maintaining his presence at the heart of Israel's life, at the heart of the land. Holiness radiates from the Holy Spirit behind the curtain out to Israel. The land is holy because the Holy Spirit is charging it with holiness, as it were, at the very heart uh, of Israel's cultic life, the temple itself. That is why the land is holy. And yet when Israel uh, fails to keep the covenant, what is the first sign? The first sign is that the Holy Spirit evacuates the the uh, temple. And when he evacuates the temple, there is nothing left uh, to conquer. It becomes a haunt for jackals. It's burned down. It's destroyed. Weeds grow up and, and, and thorns and thistles claim it. It becomes like the Garden of Eden after the fall. Now, the New Testament isn't just a continuation of Sinai. It's not, okay, all this we will do, but now you come to Jesus, and it's all this we will really, really do this time with Jesus' help. Rather, the differences are stark. We see this especially in our Lord's last week on the Temple Mount, where he issues the woes, the prophetic curses, On the nation of Israel, even its uh, beloved symbols, the fig tree is cursed. And he says, may may no one ever eat from your fruit again. These are very decisive actions he takes uh, on the Temple Mount. Pronounces woes on the religious leaders. Woes on the nation. Woes on the temple. Which is why he tells the, uh, the disciples, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mount... Go jump into the sea. (laughs) Because this is exactly what Jesus has come to do. He's come to, as it were, throw the temple into the sea. He is the temple. Uh, Now the Old Testament temple is about to become obsolete. As in the Abrahamic covenant, the mediator of the new covenant isn't a mere prophet like Moses, but is God himself. Hebrews 3, 1 through 6 makes that point in vivid terms. There are other significant differences. The Sinai blessings are temporal, never meant to be eternal. They're conditional upon Israel's obedience, and they're limited to a particular geographical uh, political nation. While the Abrahamic slash New Covenant uh, blesses people with everlasting blessings, is unconditional, and is global. Unconditional in the sense that God will realize his purposes. And you know you're in the ambit of this Abrahamic promise, distinct from the national law, uh, when despite Israel's sin, the promise is given, I will be faithful, I will bring you back, after I have scattered you, I will bring you back to this place, I will, I will, I will, I will give you a new heart, I will write my law on your heart. I will forgive your sins. And all this I will do because of the promise I made to Abraham. Or to the fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As the Apostle Paul says, law and promise refer to two covenants. Represented by two different mediators. Two different mothers, Sarah and Hagar and two different mountains, Sinai and Zion, Galatians 4, 23 to 26, which probably was the most jarring part of uh, the whole epistle to the Judaizers. Um, Paul surely got his, his history wrong. We're, Hagar is not our mother. Uh, and Paul even makes the point, you know Mount Sinai in Arabia? <laughs> not Mount Zion. Not Mount Zion. In any case, the writer to the Hebrews labors the point that the law of Moses and everything pertaining to it was a typological shadow insofar as 
that typological shadow led people to Christ, it fulfilled its role. But now that Christ has come, to treat it as the reality is, in fact, to believe another gospel, to embrace another gospel. The writer to the Hebrews says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. What are the better promises? Well, conditional versus unconditional. When the prophets prosecute God's case against Israel as a nation, then, the basis of exile is the Sinai covenant. But when he promises the fulfillment of the everlasting promise that God made to Abraham, he promises an enlarging of Israel's tents. The nation will be enlarged, not entirely wiped out. There will be a remnant left, and then from that remnant, people will be drawn from every nation, tribe, kindred, and people. God will unilaterally circumcise the hearts of his people and write the law on their hearts because he will forgive their sins. And Jeremiah says it will not be like the covenant at Sinai. His people will inherit the earth, Matthew 5.5, 5, not a sliver of real estate. In fact, the distinction between heaven and earth eventually will disappear completely in the vision of Revelation 11, 19, and 21, 22. With uh, the advent of the reality, the shadowy administration is gone. The covenant of law, Sinai, is now designated the old covenant. And the writer to the Hebrews adds, Hebrews 8, 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he obviously makes the first one obsolete. So the Old Covenant is obsolete. The Old Testament saints themselves long for this redemption. They, they long for this heavenly city. They long for redemption from the curse that the law was unable to overcome and an outpouring of the Spirit that would change the face of the world. Moses longing in Numbers 11 for the day when the Spirit would pour, be poured out on uh, all of the Lord's people was played fortissimo in the prophets as they announced the new thing that God would do in the last days. And it was this hope of Moses that Peter saw now being fulfilled among the Gentiles, which is how we get the Jerusalem Council uh, in Acts 15 and the, the wonderful outcome, the consensus of the whole church, the apostles and the elders gathered together, that the Holy Spirit has been poured out, that the there is no clean, unclean distinction between peoples. Now, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. Yet the Spirit's presence was also conditioned on the national theocratic level by the provisionary, temporary, and contingent nature of the Sinai Covenant. And so uh, the Holy Spirit was given provisionally to kings to rule well, to prophets to preach his word. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Uh, the Holy Spirit anointed them for certain tasks. And that's the context, I believe, of David's confession in Psalm 51 when he says, take, he pleads with the Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me personally, but also as the king of Israel, uh, the, the, the source of all of my wisdom, the source of all of my authority. Ezekiel prophesies, the Spirit's outpouring in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. See, all of the, who's the actor here? Not I will if you, but I will, I will, I will. Not if you obey, you will live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I will make you obedient. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. So the irony is you can't get to the new creation through the law, but once you have the new creation, the very precepts of the law begin to be fulfilled truly for the first time. 
In a remarkably Trinitarian passage, the pre-incarnate Christ says in Isaiah 48, 16, Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his Holy Spirit have sent me. A wonderful, amazing passage. For Ezekiel, it's a, the sound of God's voice is especially like a mighty wind. And that mighty wind is uh, something that we meet again in the prophets, but finally, ultimately, with the mighty wind that rushes into the upper room at Pentecost. To be sure, the Holy Spirit had already made his debut in Jesus' ministry. At the beginning of it, in fact, he announced that he is the Spirit-anointing servant who is himself the Spirit-anointed Savior. And he fulfills the topology of the year of Jubilee. All of this in, of course, Luke 4, uh, verses 16 and following. Later in his ministry, Luke 10, Jesus sends out the 70 and... and uh, uh, they proclaim good news to the surrounding towns going out ahead of Jesus two by two as witnesses, once again, the legal judicial form of this, where two are gathered. Uh, uh, you had to have two witnesses in a courtroom. We're meant probably to recall the appointment of uh, seven, uh, uh, 70 elders uh, under Moses to assist him in Numbers 11.29. A portion of the spirit that was upon Moses would be given to the elders. And that's what happens here. Similarly, a portion of the spirit upon Jesus is given to the 70 who go out. But this is not yet Pentecost. This is not yet the general outpouring. It was just a preview of things to come. Let's turn now to differences between the spirit's presence in the Old and New Covenants. The sheer repetition in the prophets of God's promise to pour out his spirit in the last days, Isaiah 32, verse 16, or 44, 3, Ezekiel 39, 28, and 29, and Joel 2, 28, indicates a qualitatively new manifestation of the spirit in the future. Not just quantitative, but qualitative. Elijah may have given to Elisha a double portion of the spirit that was upon him, 2 Kings 2.9. But Jesus was given the spirit without measure, John 3.34. And as baptism visibly signifies and seals, we are sharers in Christ's anointing. We share in his being anointed to the full by the Holy Spirit. As the Heidelberg Catechism instructs, Jesus is Christ because he is the one anointed by the Spirit as prophet, priest, and king. And we are called Christians because through faith we share in his anointing. But even Jesus received this anointing prior to the eschatological fullness of the Spirit's outpouring and indwelling that his resurrection and exaltation achieved for us. Jesus can even promise his disciples that they will do greater works. Greater works than the signs and wonders that he was performing. Precisely because he was going to the Father in exalted glory and would send the Spirit from the Father. In addition to Jesus' teaching, the apostles interpret Pentecost as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, as we've just heard. It's not just a continuation even a heightening of the Spirit's work in previous days. It's something that is unheard of even in the ministry of Jesus. Cyril of Alexandria explained, Certainly the holy prophets received in abundance the enlightenment and illumination of the Spirit, capable of instructing the apostles in the knowledge of future things and in the understanding of mysteries. Nevertheless, we confess that in the faithful of Christ, there is not only an illumination, but also the very dwelling and abode of the Holy Spirit. The difference is so stark, so stark that Paul in 2 Corinthians can actually contrast what is prior as the, 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 the ministry of death under Moses and the law. 
from the ministry of the Spirit and life. But that's already what John the Baptist said, as I pointed out. He is the one, Jesus is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So now we come a little closer to answering the question about the continuity between the Spirit's work before and after Pentecost. Surely the episodes in which the Spirit is said to be upon Christ, Matthew 12, 18, Luke uh, 4, 18, or in which the Holy Spirit joins his benediction to the fathers at Christ's baptism or empowers him in word and deed, at, at, surely these episodes are a, qua a quantitative advance on the Spirit's bestowal in, in the past. And surely the event in John 20, verses 22 and 23, is significant. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And so this is, this is quite significant that he's giving this authority to the apostles because he breathes on them, and in breathing on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. In these passages, we discover intimations of something new, of a gift that exceeds anything in previous eras. But we can't help but sense that a qualitative change occurs with Pentecost that not only distinguishes the new covenant from the old, but distinguishes the disciples' endowment of the Spirit in John 20 from the one that they received together with all the Lord's people at Pentecost. The Spirit had not been given even during Jesus' ministry in the way that he would be poured out at Pentecost. And so I, I'm arguing it's not just a question of breadth being poured out on everybody, not just the apostles and the 70 perhaps, uh, but also in quality, in depth, in, in the way the Spirit comes upon people, not just for a ministry or a mission, but now to indwell people forever as a deposit. The Holy Spirit will descend when the glorified king gives the word. That's the interesting thing. You know, the Holy Spirit drives him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit, they're sort of trading places. Now Jesus is, as it were, driving him down, sending the Holy Spirit from the Father for the ground campaign. When the king gives the word, the Spirit goes forth, and he uh, is at work within us to bring about the will of, of the, the risen and ascended king. As Paul's ascension theology in Ephesians 4 makes clear, it's only with the triumphal entry of the warrior king into the heavenly throne room that the spoils of victory can be distributed, and that's what the Spirit is associated with. Okay, think back to the, to, to, to the paradigmatic way Israel thought it, its story and therefore its identity. Uh, Exodus, conquest. And now that is, is being played out again, but only in a, in a completely different key. What kind of conquest is happening? Well, the conquest of the nations, but it's not a geopolitical conquest, driving the nations out of the land physically, rather sending the gospel to the, to the ends of the earth, and the Holy Spirit is the one who distributes the spoils of victory. Christ ascended, Ephesians 4, Christ ascended, and when he ascended, he poured out his spirit, and his spirit is, is distributing all of the gifts to the body of Christ. Just as when God conquered the nations, he allotted territories and plots of land to each of the 12 tribes. Now the spirit gives to each of us according to the measure of his gift, the allotment of paradise, the allotment of the gifts that we need in his kingdom. Again, there are intimations in Jesus' ministry. One, led out by the Spirit for holy war, conquest. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Two, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God or the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come. The announcement that the kingdom is present. The Holy Spirit uh, is the one by whom he is performing these miracles and subduing the demons. Three, the mission of the 70. And Jesus saying, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. 
Fourth, the breathing on the disciples that bestows on them the Holy Spirit. And yet they have to wait for Pentecost, Jesus says, to be clothed with power on, on, uh, from on high. They still have to wait. With all of that, they still have to wait for us to catch up with them. And only together in the upper room at Pentecost, with the whole people of God, do they experience together what we experience as well ever since. It's very clear from Acts 2.33 that it's only with his ascension, exalted to the right hand of God, that Christ, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, has now at Pentecost poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. The point is also supported by John 7, 37 through 39. At the climax of the Feast of Booths, the water drawing ceremony uh, celebrating the miraculous provision of water from the rock, which was Christ, uh, Jesus identifies himself as that rock. And just as he gives himself as true food and drink, John 6, so here he promises, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is why the Spirit had not yet been given fully. Jesus had not yet been glorified. Who is the Holy Spirit going to unite us to for salvation? If he's not glorified, then we're damned if he unites us to him. He has to unite us to the glorified Christ so that our glorification is secured forever. So the people have to wait. They have to wait until the Holy Spirit is, as it were, finished with Jesus. <laughs> finished making him into what he has come to be in our human nature for us. Literally, the text reads, for the Spirit was not yet because Jesus was not glorified. Well, of course, he existed, but it's emphasizing the point that he was not yet given because he was not yet glorified. As late in the uh, story as his farewell discourse, Jesus told the disciples that the Holy Spirit was already with them. Crucial verse, John 14, 17. He is already with you, but he will be within you. Very clear distinction that Jesus draws. So right now he is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. But in the future, he will be in you. Beginning to see the qualitative difference between what happened before Pentecost and after Pentecost. Not just Old Testament, New Testament, but even how the experience of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is carried forward through Jesus' ministry with a heightening, but only becomes qualitatively new at Pentecost. Especially... Uh, in its running controversy with Anabaptists, Reformed theology has sometimes uh, emphasized the unity of the covenant without fleshing out fully some of the discontinuities. I, it's entirely appropriate to, to use continuity as the baseline for the covenant of, of, of grace, for the Abrahamic promise, to see that in terms of continuity to see it in terms of qualitative differences, uh, quantitative differences. There is no break in the Abrahamic covenant across the two testaments. It's simply the covenant of grace, the covenant of promise. However, there is a clear discontinuity, even contrast drawn, even in the prophets themselves between Sinai and the Abrahamic and new covenants. This contrast is the heart of Paul's argument in Galatians, which reaches a crescendo in chapter 3, verses 15 to 18. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, 
does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the Abrahamic promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. It's striking that we find both of these points, continuity of the covenant of grace and discontinuity between the old and new covenants, Sinai and Zion, in the same verse. And as I say, this contrast is already drawn by Jeremiah when he says that the new covenant will not be like the covenant at Sinai. So the, the key interpretive question is not whether to embrace continuity or discontinuity in the abstract, which you prefer, but to determine the sense in which there is continuity, especially Abrahamic promise and new covenant, and discontinuity, Sinai law, old covenant. Not that these are opposed, but these are completely distinct. Different promises, different mediators, uh, different terms. The proper emphasis on the unity of God's saving plan shouldn't keep us from recognizing the clear discontinuities indicated in Scripture. Uh, there's one way of, of tracing this, and I'll just summarize this point here very briefly. Uh, the one way of, of thinking about it, I've wondered, is uh, uh, comparing uh, the giving of the Spirit to forgiveness, because these are often in the prophets, the two, they, they often come as twin gifts uh, of the last days. Forgiveness of sins and, and the Holy Spirit uh, being poured out. Uh, can we see uh, a parallel here, just as we, we don't actually find final, complete forgiveness of sins under the Old Covenant. And yet, through the typological system of the sacrifices and the temple, faith is directed to Christ for forgiveness of sins. Can we not also see that the Holy Spirit's gift uh, is, uh, is, is present in the Old Testament by anticipation, but only in the New Covenant as a reality. God overlooked sins. God covered sins through the sacrificial system. But only in the new covenant does he take them away, as the writer to the Hebrews emphasizes. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The writer of the Hebrews underscores the point that, when, that every time you, you, you got in the, uh, in the van with your goat and the four kids and headed off to Jerusalem uh, for Passover, you were reminded the whole way driving down the freeway, uh, the bleeding goat and everything, that of your sins. The whole time you're driving, you're reminded of your sins. Of course, you're also reminded with the kids in the car of your sins. Uh, but the, the, it's a reminder every year, the writer to the Hebrew says of sins, not so with the atonement of Christ. Here you have propitiation and expiation. Here you're not reminded anymore, they're gone. They're completely blotted out. Isn't there a similarly qualitative difference really between the Spirit's gift in the Old Testament and the Spirit's gift in the New? The Holy Spirit is given not to the nation, a geopolitical nation, He's given, not, and he's given not just to representative prophets, priests, and kings of the nation, but is given to all of his people who now inherit the earth and not a single uh, sliver of real estate. I concur then with John Stott's conclusion that Old Testament believers were justified, Romans 4, 1 through 8, based on Genesis 15, 6, which assumes regeneration, Paul couldn't say that Abraham was justified by faith as we were otherwise. Further, Stott says, they claimed to love God's law, Psalm 119. Since the unregenerate nature is hostile to God and resistant to his law, Romans 8, 7, they seem to have possessed a new nature. We sing the psalms in Christian worship because we recognize in them the language of the regenerate. And yet, Stott adds, 
the Holy Spirit came upon special people for special ministries at special times. But now his ministry is wider and deeper than ever it was in the Old Testament days. While I share Stott's basic conclusions, I think that Sinclair Ferguson brings out the tension a little more between continuity and discontinuity. On one hand, he rejects the idea that, quote, there is a major dichotomy between the Spirit's ministry in the Old and the New Covenants. For instance, Nicodemus, he says, should have known that uh, the, the, uh, the, the kingdom was coming only through new birth. He should have known this. On the other hand, Ferguson warns against flattening the contours of redemptive history and of undermining the genuine diversity and development from old to new covenants. He continues, Paul's teaching in 2 Corinthians 3 indicates that there is an epochal development from the old to the new precisely in terms of the ministry of the Spirit. As with the Son, there is an incompleteness about the Old Testament's revelation of the Spirit, end quote. But I don't think it's just an incompleteness of the revelation of the Spirit in the Old Testament, as is the case with Christ. It's an incompleteness in redemptive history because the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. In short, the continuity is to be found in the Abrahamic promise realized fully in the New Covenant, while the discontinuities belong especially to the differences between Old and New Covenants, Sinai, and Zion. The Old Covenant saints were regenerated but not baptized with the Spirit. They were forgiven and justified through faith by anticipation, but they had to wait to receive the promised reality with us, Hebrews says. The Spirit came upon certain saints in the Old Testament, but today, since Pentecost, he has poured out on all of the saints and indwells each and every one of them as a permanent arrow bomb deposit on final redemption. And so we never have to pray with David, plead with David, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, now, what about where we are today? Uh, what is the relationship between this event and today then, if, if, if there is a, a qualitative difference that Pentecost brings to history such that even the disciples themselves had not realized, the, the, uh, had not experienced the Holy Spirit in his fullness until that event, what are we to say about our relationship to Pentecost today? Most of the contemporary debates over tongues, prophecy, and healing turn on whether these gifts continue in our day. But in my view, this is a secondary question. The primary question is, what are these sign gifts in the first place? All sides can agree that the book of Acts is filled with signs and wonders attesting to fresh new covenant revelation. We all agree with that. That's not in debate. Well, I mean, I say we all. Uh, uh, all, all of us who believe that uh, these miracles actually occurred and, and can occur in any period of history God chooses. The Pauline epistles refer to the activity of apostles and prophets as well as to gifts of healing, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. So we believe that these, these are gifts that he has given. The question is, what are these gifts? Before we can even address the question of whether they're still around. First of all, all of the gifts, all of the charismata that the Spirit gives as identified in Acts and the epistles are, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, for the common good. Not one of the spiritual gifts is given for the private anything of anyone. Not for the private edification, not for the private uh, uh, joy, not for the private comfort, private blessing. All of the spiritual gifts are given to each of us for the whole body. Each must employ it for one another, Paul, uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 4.10. Second, all of the gifts were given first and foremost to advance the gospel. 
to advance the gospel throughout the world and to build up the saints in the, in, in, uh, the word of God. They all intersect in the ministry of the word, and that's why Ephesians 4 focuses so specifically on the ministry of pastor teachers, along with the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists. Pastor teachers, all of these are offices surrounding the ministry of the word. Throughout Acts, the growth of the church is attributed to the spirit working through the word. We read, and the word of God spread. The first sign at Pentecost itself that the Spirit has been poured out in these last days is that Peter Peter preaches a a Christ-centered sermon and the Holy Spirit cuts the people to the quick and they ask what they must do to be saved. The gift of tongues at Pentecost was obviously a supernatural ability to proclaim the gospel in an actual known tongue that they themselves did not know. What's so remarkable, what's so remarkable and remarked upon by the onlookers is not that they were speaking unknown languages, but that they were speaking languages known to some of the hearers even though they had not learned those languages. They had a supernatural ability to do UN translation right there on the spot of the gospel they were preaching. The remarkable thing was we hear each of us the gospel in our own language. Not we we, we can't believe is gibberish. They're not even speaking in sensible words. How can it be that we each hear the gospel spoken in our own tongues? And so the gift of interpretation is simply the supernatural ability to translate. Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul's entire rebuke is based on the perversion of tongues into a private gift that engenders pride rather than a public gift that serves the good of the whole body and of all the believers. One who desires the gift of tongues, he says, should pray that he may interpret. In other words, if you have the gift to speak in other languages supernaturally, pray that you have the ability to translate it. (laughs) What use is it to, to, to be able to do that when others standing by don't know what you're saying? So have the ability to translate as well as to speak. For if I pray in a tongue, Paul says, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. That is not a description of the proper use of this gift. I have a private prayer language so that when I I pray in my private prayer language, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. No, Paul is saying that's what you shouldn't do. It's an argument against tongues without interpretation. It's a an argument against private seeing tongues as a private prayer language. As Stott argues, it is clear that he simply cannot contemplate Christian prayer and praise in which the mind is not actively engaged. But then what about the distinction that Paul draws between edifying the church and the tongue speaker edifying only himself? With Stott, I conclude it's ironing, if not sarcasm. Uh, If in verses 13 and 14, Paul is pointing up the deficiency of speaking in tongues without translation, then Stott's conclusion seems entirely likely here to me. To say that the one who speaks in tongues without translation is only edifying himself is a critique, not an exhortation. What about prophecy? Well, throughout Scripture, prophecy is given to reveal matters of public and not just private significance. Like the signs, they point to the reality signified. Jesus doesn't go around healing everyone. Jesus doesn't go around just performing signs and wonders, you know, making a, whipping up a, a latte out of thin air just because someone wants a coffee. He, Jesus performs signs that are specific revelations of his identity as the Messiah of the world. Similarly, prophecy, anything God says, everything God says, 
It, it has a public redemptive historical significance. Even when prophets receive a particular word for what they're to do and where they're to go and what they're to say, it, it's not for their own personal use, but serves a, a public pur, uh, purpose. Hosea is told to marry a prostitute, not as a private person, establishing a model for expecting a word from the Lord about whom one should marry. Rather, God commanded him to do it in order to publish to Israel, this is the state of your covenant breaking before me. I am your loyal husband, and you are my unfaithful spouse. Third, some of the spiritual gifts are for the extraordinary ministry of the apostolic era. It's like boosters on those old rockets that used to fall away as the rocket uh, uh, no longer needed them. And other gifts for the ongoing ministry of the church after the apostles' death. The 70, when they come back breathless, that the demons are subject to them. They, they can't believe this. They're amazed. But there's no indication that they held an office, the office of the 70, and that they went out every Tuesday and Thursday regularly on these missions until they died. The episode uh, reminds us of the 70 elders under Moses' ministry in Numbers 11. They prophesied as a testimony to their endowment for leadership by the Spirit. And yet we read Numbers 11.25, And as soon as the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. The point is, it's for specific purposes, public announcements. God uses prophets as PA systems. Whatever prophecy they have, it's not simply for private use. The apostles were unique eyewitnesses to Christ. There is a qualitative distinction they draw between the foundation laying episode of the church's history and building on that foundation, which we do ever since the office of Timothy. Ephesians 2.20 and 3.5 speak of this foundation laying uh, episode. 1 Corinthians 3, for no one can lay a foundation other than the foundation that has been laid. And now ordinary ministers build on the foundation either with quality materials or with straw. And Paul could invoke his immediate calling by Jesus in Galatians as the basis for his apostleship and call the gospel he preaches my gospel and yet tell Timothy to guard the deposit he received from him. Not to seek a direct and immediate call from the Lord, but when, when Timothy's knees began to shake, he says, remember the gift that was given to you when the presbytery, presbyterio, the elders, laid hands on you. And so the apostles were called immediately and directly by Jesus. The ordinary ministers who followed were called immediately through the mediation, through by Christ through the mediation uh, of his church, through the officers that he had appointed. After Pentecost, then, there is an increasing emphasis on the Spirit's triumph through the spreading of the word rather than through new revelation. And that's why when they ask the Reformers, what are the miracles you can point to? You know, we've, we've got uh, the stigmata, we have... Uh, you know, the, um, uh, Jesus appearing at the, the fountain in Lourdes and so forth. We've got all these miracles. What about you? What are your miracles? And Calvin scratches his head and he says, the, uh, let's see, the turning water into wine, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, um, uh, healing those who were oppressed with demons, so forth. His point was, uh, we don't have a new gospel, so we don't need new miracles. The gifts of healing, tongues, and interpretation clustered around the supernova of Christ and his apostles. The Holy Spirit is free to heal. He's free to speak. speak. He's free to rend the heavens if he chooses and proclaim his word immediately 
and directly apart from the instrumentality of his written scriptures and his preachers. He's absolutely free to do that at any time. But there is no office that he has appointed for this to be done today. There is no ongoing office of prophet, uh, no ongoing office of apostle for these to be ongoing works that we expect to see. Um, all right, I'm going to skip. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about, uh, you know, spar a little bit on that, I'm very happy to hear pushback uh, on that point, especially on, on prophecy. So feel free to uh, ask that during the Q&A time, uh, if you would. Let me, just, let me just conclude. Believers today do not need another Pentecost. The world today doesn't need another Pentecost. Any more than we need another resurrection or another crucifixion, or another incarnation. Instead, we need to turn our sails into that wind that still blows from Pentecost. That still does exactly what happened at Pentecost. The peak of Pentecost was Peter proclaiming Christ. 3,000 people coming to faith in Christ, and that growing and spreading, and day by day the Lord was adding to their number those who should be saved. That is still for today. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is still raising the dead. He can do it however he chooses. But we can only put our confidence in what he has promised to bless by his word. Precisely because the Spirit is at work through his word, and that word is sufficient, we do not need the props of the earlier period as the writer to the Hebrews reminds us, and we conclude with this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we have come now to the climax of the movie and that we're living still in that era of the great, the, 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 the great climax of all of your redemptive purposes in your Son. That we live in these last days. They seem long to us, perhaps, but to you, a day is like a thousand years. You have your plan, you have your purposes. Some may scoff and say, where is the promise of his coming, and yet... Every day, every day that, that you wait is a productive waiting, not simply a waiting, but another day of working, of your spirit bringing your elect, those who have not yet been united to your saving son, to come to faith in him, to embrace him for life. We thank you for sending your spirit. We thank you for... Uh, the Spirit indwelling us, making us his sanctuary. We thank you that together with all of your saints, with the whole church, we are able, because of the indwelling Spirit, to proclaim your word to the nations. Give us even greater desire and unction to do that, we pray, in these last days. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Right, uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, another rich uh, take on uh, taking us through uh, the scriptures in, uh, in both breadth and depth. Uh, as is our practice now, we will uh, take uh, questions. There'll be people moving amongst you that have a, uh, a microphone. Um, Michael needs no mediator or advocate in this setting, in an eternal one, of course he does and has one. But, uh, so I'm going to, he, he will just field the questions as we go, but if you start making statements and not questions, I'll interfere and say, is there a question? But uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll try that today and, uh, and see how we go. So uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions uh, after that, and uh, if you'd like to just indicate, people will move to you with a microphone and you'll be able to uh, answer that, uh, those questions. First one up there, have we got? Yep. Great, thanks. Um, you spoke about a uh, qualitative distinction between the Old Covenant and New Covenant effectively at Pentecost. 
What are the implications there for us as Christians when we look back at the teaching of Christ, say for example the ethical teaching of Christ, how can we differentiate that in quality between say the, the Mosaic law or something like that? So is effectively that just in the same category, the Jesus teaching and the law with respect to new covenant ethics for the Christian? Yeah, great, great uh, question. Um, on one hand, there you know there there are some our, our dispensational brothers who distinguish between content, the the law of the Old Testament, uh, the moral law of, of the Ten Commandments, di uh, uh, differs from the moral law of the New Testament. Different different commands. Uh, but uh, as Reformed Christians, we look at the the difference as eschatological, uh, and. Just, I think the best answer to your question for me is when uh, is when John says, uh, "I am uh, delivering to you uh, a new commandment that you love one another." Oh wait, it's not a new commandment. No, it's an old commandment. It's kind of new because now Jesus Christ has come. That's the kind of, I think that's the kind of process we're meant to go through when we think of God's moral law. It's, it's old, but it's new in a way. Why? It's new because for the first time, we can love it. We can cherish it. The amazing thing Paul's, it, it, that still convinces me Paul's talking about himself as a believer, eight, uh, uh, I join eight people in the world today, still believe that, uh, but... Um, is that he says that he, he loves the law even when he's sinning. He acknowledges that the law is right and he's wrong. And, and that's not an unbeliever. That's, that, that is uh, a consciousness uh, of guilt that, that where you still, you this is why we have tension in the Christian life. The, the unbeliever doesn't have tension. He, you know, he, he might have a tension between being unhealthy and the sin that he's uh, addicted to. But he doesn't have this tension between obedience to, to God and his law, which he loves, and finding himself falling short of that law day by day. Um, so that's, I, that, it's the eschatological. Now that Christ has come, now that Christ is the embodiment of the will of God, now that the Holy Spirit uh, is, is indwelling us, uh, now, we, we, because we have justification in the forgiveness of sins, because the Spirit indwells us, we are now able for the first time to look at the commandments with new eyes. Is that? Yeah. Trying to look at the qualitative difference between the teaching of Christ, Christ and the Old Covenant when you're looking back from this end. You know what I mean? Like, if we're in the qualitative difference era... Oh. Yeah. Great. Okay. Now, sorry, I understand a little bit more. Yes, there is uh, the 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 uh, moral law at the heart of the old covenant is is still present. I take that to be everlasting. If God is going to make a world with creatures like us morally responsible, given His nature, the law He has given us is what He would give. To human, it is eternal, it is everlasting. As long as there there are human beings, and God is who He is, that law is that moral law is uh, uh, is set in stone. But God stapled the civil and ceremonial laws to that moral law uh, as an addendum, as it were, for the old covenant. Now that that covenant is obsolete, those have fallen away. Those pages are gone. And I uh, uh, would take the Sermon on the Mount to be what's stapled to the moral law. The Sermon on the Mount is, is a radically new kind of uh, polity in the body of Christ. Uh, if you're a Jew standing there listening to what Jesus is saying, he's saying the old covenant is obsolete. <laughs> when he's saying no more holy war, holy war is now loving your neighbors, praying for those who persecute you and preaching the gospel. 
so forth. It's, it's ra a radically different polity. And now it means that we as believers have a, a deeper responsibility to each other than Jews had toward each other in the Old Covenant. Can't sue each other, can't, uh, you have to settle our disputes amongst ourselves. Uh, our, our closest kin are not even those we're related to, not even our children or our wife. My wife is first of all my sister, and secondly my wife. This is weird. Uh, it's, it's, a weird it's a weird covenant, it's a weird time, but it's, it, and, and, and this only anticipates the day when Jesus Christ returns and uh, there will be no giving in marriage. There will be, there will be the body of Christ. The, the, the body of Christ, the church, will be the ultimate reality, the church with Christ as its head. It's hard, hard to imagine, but the Sermon on the Mount anticipates. It's a semi-realized polity. G'day, Michael. Uh, thank you for that lecture. Uh, it was brilliant. Uh, this is the only lecture that I've heard, so um, I don't know if this question has been asked or you've addressed it in the previous lectures. This is my uh, day off, uh, so opportunity to come. I love the Holy Spirit more after your lecture, which is uh, awesome. Uh, my question is, can we ask as Christians for the Holy Spirit to fill us? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular of Acts 4.31, the disciples ask for boldness to proclaim the word of God. The Holy Spirit comes, shakes the room, fills them up. They don't pray for filling. Uh, they pray for boldness, but the Holy Spirit does fill them. Can we pray specifically for filling of the Holy Spirit, or do we just pray for, let's do the mission of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will do his work? Uh, yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that question. I, I like John Stott's distinction between baptism and fullness, but I don't want to turn that into a, a sort of uh, an official kind of division or distinction. Uh, when, I think when Paul says in Galatians that we're to be filled with the Spirit rather than drunk with wine, uh, and, and we are to keep on being filled with the Spirit, he's drawing on an analogy uh, uh, that's, that's obvious. Uh, drunk with wine, you're under the influence of alcohol versus being under the influence of the, of the Spirit. And uh, yeah, there are, there are uh, clearly times in our lives when uh, we are more or less driven by the Holy Spirit, not indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but driven, de determined. Uh, the Holy Spirit is someone you can quench. It's one of the reasons why I, uh, I, I don't know how people can deny the, the distinct personhood of the Holy Spirit. You can't quench a thing, um, but we quench the Holy Spirit. All of this is possible. Um, he never leaves us. Um, but we, we, can, we can quench him, and, uh, you know, he keeps coming back. He doesn't wait for us to invite him back, you know, but he, uh, it, you know, it, it, it is part of our responsibility to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's uh, fullness in our lives, and uh, I, I, I think sometimes we're wary of doing that. We're wary of... of praying for that greater fullness of the Holy Spirit because we associate it with excess. And uh, uh, I don't think we should. All of us are baptized into Christ, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but uh, we're, all of us are going through different uh, you know, stages, even in the same day, of uh, being filled by, being, being aware of, being overtaken by, being overwhelmed by a sense of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, if I heard you correctly, sorry, can you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if I heard you correctly, you said that Jesus had the Spirit to the full, and then you said we share in Jesus' anointing. So are you saying that our experience of the Spirit is the same as Jesus' experience? And in particular, would you say that our experience of the Spirit as believers should be described as yeah, anointing? You know, off the top of my head, I can't think of examples where believers are spoken of as being anointed. I think the language of a down payment or guarantee is quite common. Yeah, so our experience of the Spirit. Yeah, I'll have to think of, I'll, uh, think on, on uh, 
this a little bit more. Um, but I, I, uh, my my initial thought here is, yes, that the, the uh, our anointing that we share with Jesus uh, is a part of the co inheritance that we have with Him. That's the amazing thing that we are co heirs with Christ, not associate heirs, but co heirs. So whatever He possesses, because we are united to Him, we possess that also. It's not that, you know, I mean, we, we possess what he has. Whatever he has in his humanity, we have. Obviously, we don't have the glorification yet, but we have it objectively already. It's, it's, a, it's a, a done deal. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the question then is, what is the Holy Spirit who has anointed us, doing with us in this in this present age, and do we associate that anointing with miracles of healing, signs and wonders, and so forth? Um, I don't I don't see in the scriptures any direct correlation between uh, the anointing itself and the spectacular character of the signs and wonders that are performed. Um, to be anointed, to share in His anointing is to be made prophets, priests, and kings. And uh, there is no greater dignity uh, than that. It's not just an office that some people hold. Now, it's true in the church. Some people hold the office of pastors, elders, deacons. But all Christians hold the office of prophet, priest, and king, which just wasn't true in the Old Testament. And we have that in union with Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king. In his anointing, we are anointed. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, my question concerns the application of the law in the age of the Spirit along the lines that was just asked. And you spoke in regard to the moral application of the Lord law. Uh, I'd like to ask a question in regard to the um, ceremonial application of the law. There are those um, within the Reformed tradition in your part of the world that are advocating for normative application of the law, including ceremonial, where the Passover becomes communion, um, circumcision, baptism, etc. I think your friend Doug Wilson is one of them. <laughs> and uh, I wonder if you could comment on that in applying the law in the Age of the Spirit Whilst Jesus remains the fulfilment of the law and uh, the actual man-centred activities do not, you know, how, how, can we, uh, how can we view these types of teachings without um, descending into a man-centred application um, and fulfilment of the law? Uh, I'm not sure about the man-centred part, what makes, what, what makes it man-centred, but... Um, let me just uh, focus on the, the uh, completion of the ceremonial law. I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, to know exactly how to answer uh, the objections uh, of those who want to continue either the, the civil laws of the theocracy or the ceremonial laws. It seems to me, and I mean this with all sincerity, that you, you have to rip the, the epistle to the Hebrews out of your New Testament in order to make those moves. Um, the whole burden of, the, of Hebrews, and you could argue it from other places, but, but the whole burden of Hebrews is don't go back to the previews when the movie is out. <laughs> and that's what they're doing. Uh, and I see that being, I mean, that is the Judaizing heresy. And uh, I fear that it, on the on the edges, on the fringes, uh, let's say the wild fringes of uh, the Reformed tradition today, there are those who have those Judaizing temptations. Hi. Oh, wow. Um, 
I haven't come to any of the other lectures, so you may have answered this question at some point, but um, I just wanted clarification um, over the covenant to Abraham and the specifically the aspects of the conditional and unconditional. Um, to what point do we distinguish between parts of it being unconditional um, and parts of it being conditional, and mainly the aspect of the land of Canaan being distinguished from um, the new creation um, in terms of it being an everlasting possession. Um, just one clarification. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, very helpful. I, uh, first of all, the Abrahamic covenant I take to be wholly gracious, wholly unilateral, wholly gift. Uh, in Genesis 15, uh, as you know, there, uh, everything that happens there in that promise would have been familiar to Abraham, anyone like Abraham, uh, a leading figure in his world, a political figure in his world. He would have known what's happening. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the strange figure, Melchizedek, offering bread and wine. He's paying homage to him. Uh, there's, a, there's clearly a covenant ratification going on there with the bread and the wine. Uh, he acknowledges uh, Melchizedek as his lord, as his liege lord, uh, which he would only do of, I, I, I would argue, would only do of Yahweh. He was his only uh, liege lord. In any case, uh, God is making all of these promises to him which is not usually what a liege lord does. The liege lord usually says, I have delivered you, therefore keep these terms of living in my land or I'll kick you out. And that's what we find in Leviticus. You are but tenants in my land. That's what God tells Israel. You are but tenants in my land. Oh, and when you go in, don't say that it's because of your righteousness and your, you know, I gave you this land. So it, he gives the, the land by grace because in this Abrahamic promise, God says, I will give you an earthly land. I'll give you an earthly inheritance. Uh, then there are commands that follow. Now you're to live like this. You're to do this. You're to circumcise uh, your son on the eighth day and so forth. But uh, it's an outright gift right at the outset. Then the second promise is of an everlasting redemption of the blessing for all the families of the earth in one seed. So seeds is the earthly promise, blessing for everyone in his seed, singular, as Paul underscores, is uh, the basis for the, the latter. In both cases, it's grace, but with the land promise, God fulfills that uh, with uh, the conquest of Canaan in the book of Joshua. And you turn immediately in the book of Joshua from God did all this, God did, God did, God did, God gave, God gave, God gave. Then he allotted portions. Here's your parcel, Judah. Here's your parcel, Reuben. Here's your parcel. Now, the people say, okay, now we're ready to, to re-swear the oath of Sinai. All this we will do. <laughs> and Joshua says, you're joking, right? I mean, it's amazing turn to the passage, he says, no, you won't, for you can't keep this law, and God is holy, and he'll destroy you. He says, oh, no, 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 you don't, no, you don't, under, you don't understand. Our fathers did rotten stuff, but we're going to do this. And he says, all right, all right, hold up your hand. I'll swear you in, but let this be a witness against you. Let it be a witness against us, they say. And uh, it didn't go well thereafter. But, you know, there was a brief, brief and shining moment. But, uh, but God promises, but the, what are the resources for getting beyond that? If God is holy and we, we are sinful, what is the, well, it's the other promise he made to Abraham. Namely, that through a seed, he will bless, bring blessing to the nations. A seed, one person who will carry out the, uh, the mission of Israel faithfully. He will execute that office faithfully. And uh, in him, all the, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so whenever Israel, so now Israel in the land has 
the Sinai covenant for its basis of remaining in the land. On the basis of the Abrahamic covenant, they got the land. God gave it to them. But it's theirs to win or lose as tenants in God's land uh, based on their obedience. But when God throws them out, God evicts the tenants from his land, he says, but it's not over because there's still that Abrahamic promise that I made. I fulfilled the first Abrahamic promise. That's done. You blew it. But there's another Abrahamic promise, and that is of an everlasting inheritance through one seed, and as Paul says, and that seed is Christ. Yeah, just that we're at the time, there's two more questions I said. Let's try this one and see if it's a shorter one, but uh, let's we'll see here we go. Uh, well, shorter answer. Shorter right? answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to say, you know. So. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Professor Horton. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, as we know that there's an inseparable relationship between the Word of God and the person of the Holy Spirit to bring about faith and obedience in the elect, in New Testament, and through the Christian experience. I was just wondering if that relationship was there in the Old Testament, like when God spoke and gave the law, and the Word of God had the potential or the ability and to bring about faith and obedience in people in the Old Testament because they were expected to obey. And so we don't hear much that the Spirit of God is, uses the Word of God to bring about faith and obedience in the Old Testament. But I was just wondering, yeah. is it similar? Or? Great, great question. Um, it's interesting. Early uh, in Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteron Deuteronomy 15, but I'm uh, happy to be corrected. Um, God says, circumcise your own hearts. That's part of the law. Uh, you know, Deuteronomy is the covenant code, and in the covenant code itself, circumcise your own hearts. And then in, in Deuteronomy 30, which is more, more of a narrative indicating what will happen in Israel's futures. I know you're going to blow it, and here's how you're going to blow it. Already in the covenant code itself, it's God, and God telling us how Israel was going to blow it. And uh, he says, but then when that happens, uh, when, when you basically don't circumcise your hearts and you for follow the foreign gods and so forth, then uh, in latter days, I will come and I will circumcise your heart. It's one of those just tear-jerking moments where embedded in the law is the gospel. Embedded in the law as a piece of writing, as a part of the canon, is the gospel itself. I will write my law on your hearts. I will give you a new heart when you break this law, which you're going to break. Um, so, uh, no, I think that uh, uh, the Holy, they, they did rely on the Holy Spirit to keep the law, to the, love the law as heirs of the Abrahamic promise. But in terms of the nation, they knew that the Holy Spirit living in residence at the heart of Israel, distinguishing it from the nations as holy, was completely dependent on their obedience to the law. They knew that. They knew that the Holy Spirit would evacuate Israel if they failed to keep, it, keep covenant with him. So the hard thing is, to, as we're interpreting these passages and preaching these passages, we need to bear in mind what are, are the passages that are part of the law proper, you know, the canon of Israel's Sinaitic Mosaic law, what are the canon governing the theocracy, geopolitical theocracy, and then the passages that transcend that theocracy. Both are scripture for us, but one is canonical in the sense that it's still in effect as our constitution, and the other is historical, what God did in the past. If the old covenant is obsolete, then it's not canonical in that very strict sense of being in effect as, as binding on us because there's no nation for it to serve as the constitution of. The church is a spiritual nation. Okay. I think we'll uh, call it a, a day there. Uh, <laughs> you've been very generous with your time and energy. I don't know how difficult it is to answer questions after giving an address as well. So thank you very much. Can I ask you to thank Professor Horton? <laughs>
Uh, for those of you who are college students, you know your lectures will resume at 11.15. That gives us uh, half an hour to uh, go downstairs and enjoy uh, some time together. There's plenty to discuss and uh, to uh, think about. Can I remind you also we'll be starting again tomorrow morning, uh, same time, 9 o'clock, and we look forward to hearing uh, the next uh, lecture in our series. I'm going to close in prayer and then uh, we can uh, join together downstairs. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, taking us deeper into your word today and giving us much to think about. Thank you that we live in the age of fulfilment, post-Pentecost, and the pouring out of your spirit upon us all. Father, we do pray that you will help us to turn our sails into that wind that still blows and to live faithfully before you. We thank you for feeding us this morning from your word in the power of your spirit. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.